It's time to give God praise. Come on, put those hands together. I don't want 
to hide this weary soul This bag of bones I try with all my might But I just can't win this fight I'm slowly drifting Yeah, a bag of bones
Moving over the water, spirit come move over us. 
to us, oh God, and we've come to worship you this morning, oh God, to pour out our alabaster box before you, because you are worthy of all the praise and all of the glory and all of the honor that is due to your name. Please, oh God, just receive this worship. Woo! Receive this sound that comes from inside church, oh God. Let it be pleasing unto you, Jesus. Just receive it, oh God, receive it. Cause all we want is your glory to magnify you and bless you. Because you're good. Hi, my name's Joey McMahon. I've been attending the church here for about 12 years. I play on the worship team, play the bass, and I also am a member of the board. So I started attending this church at the end of 2011. I was plugged in at my church in Vegas for a long time, so when I came out here I knew one of the first things I needed to do was, you know, get get plugged into a, a really solid church out here, and so I kind of visited a few churches. Once I came here and attended a few times, uh, I came to realize that this is a really great place to be. How it's impacted my life, well, I found my wife here, hello, ka-ching. Uh, got married. When we started out, we didn't have much, but we just kept applying the principles of God's Word that we were learning here at the church and walking it out in faith. And one thing that we realized was, as we did that, God kept increasing us year after year, season after season, and just seeing the faithfulness of God in our life and in our family and with the church and the people here has been amazing. Pastor James and Sharon are God-fearing they preach the Word of God, they preach the truth of God's Word, you know, unfiltered. And I think bottom line is in our nation and in our world, we need to see the power of the Gospel preached and going forth, and signs, wonders, and miracles. And I really believe that Insight Church, the people here in our leadership, are, are great conduits for that. And, you know, Pastor James talks all the time about this being an ark of safety. And I believe that, you know, that is true. This is a place where the broken and the hurting can come and be restored and be sent out to change the world. Um, so I'm really looking forward to see what God is gonna do with our church. I really believe His hand is on us and He's gonna do great things. Hey, good morning, everyone. As they often like to say, great morning or better yet and best of all, God morning to you. Welcome back to Insight Church Online. I'm very excited about the use of technology, friends. We can be the church, friends, not just doing church, but we can be the church anywhere you are in the world. Thanks for joining us. Once again, we're going to have a life changing, mind renewing faith building time in God's word. I want to ask for your help in spreading the gospel. Jesus said, freely you receive to freely give. So go ahead and copy the link from today's online service and uh, share it on your social media platform or send a text or an email to a friend or a family member that you know could use God's word. Whenever God's word is communicated, it brings deliverance and healing and freedom. It brings hope. It brings encouragement. All the things that we need, especially in today's word, can be found in God's word, which is the gospel, the good news concerning our Lord Jesus Christ. 
I want to invite you to download our church app. If you have not done so, you can download the Insight Church app and stay connected to all the great things and all the great programs that we have uh, to help you grow in your faith as a follower of our Lord Jesus Christ. I do want to encourage you to uh, become a partner with us here at Insight Church, friends. Your support, your contribution, friends, helps to strengthen the mission and the vision of Insight Church. Um, our church is growing exponentially, and anything that grows requires more resources. So thank you again for being a partner and a participant with us, a builder in the vision that God has given us here at Insight Church. You can scan the QR code you see on your screen. You can text to give. You can visit our website at Insight Church at any time. Again, using our church app is a fantastic way to give and manage your giving profile, or you can mail your support to our post office box as well. Thanks for being a partner with us. We're excited about the Word of God. This is the thing we major on here at Insight Church. Our mission is to make and train followers of Jesus Christ and build strong families by understanding, embracing, and doing God's Word, friends, and preparing people for the day of the Lord. What an exciting time to know that we have God's Word uh, to strengthen us, friends, and to equip us to live the life of victory that God intends for us to live during this time. Prepare your heart. Get ready to receive the seed of God's word. I know you're going to be changed. Take a look at this. Say amen. amen. So we're talking about forward and uh, we started last week and going to continue today talking about going forward in faith, going forward by faith. So we're going forward, but we have to go forward in faith. We have to go forward by faith and uh, we'll see how far we get today. We're going to talk about uh, going to the other side. God doesn't just keep us on this side. He always calls us to the, the other side. We have to move forward with God. Somebody say amen. amen. Um, so we're continuing this teaching on forward. Um, you can watch the teaching from last week, of course, on, on the Internet, on YouTube. And I shared a lot of the more detailed information about our campaign. This is a time when we talk about forward. It's not just a message, but this is, this is God's vision for us a church, and we've come to a place that I believe that, that pastors need more than a message. I think pastors and churches now need a vision. Not just a message, but, but we, need a, we need a vision. Most, most pastors have, um, let's just say, a message to teach, but not all pastors have a vision to reach a dying world. Most, most have a message to preach, but they don't have a vision to reach a dying world and to reach people with a culturally relevant message and a gospel that is applicable to the challenges of the world today. You know, when I speak at conferences and I get to speak to leaders and pastors and things, I tell them, we need, we need a more intelligent gospel right now. The gospel, and we've saying for years that Jesus is the answer for the world today, but there seems to be more confusion and more disorientation, more division about things that are happening in society when we know that Jesus is the answer. But the application of the gospel has to be more intelligent to be adequately applied to the issues that we're dealing with in the world. The gospel needs to be culturally relevant. It needs to be relevant to the times in which we live. And so I say that having a message to preach is not enough. Now we need a vision to reach an emerging generation, to equip our children and our grandchildren with the resources that they need even to be the church, to be the, the body of Christ, to stand, to understand that the gates of hell can't prevail against them, to understand that, that he that is in them is greater than the one that is in the, in the world. For them to know that, that they have the advantage in life. They're not victims. They're, they're the problem that's coming. And it's up to us to teach them that the devil is more afraid of them than they should ever be afraid of the devil. That's, that's faith. That's, that's what we, we have to teach our children. That's something that has to be instilled within each of us. Somebody say amen. So we need a culturally relevant message. We got we to be able to preach during this time about the covenant of, of Abraham that extends for a thousand generations. Somebody say thousand. God, for a thousand generations, what that means is 
no matter what happens in the world, no matter what's happening in universities, no matter what's happening in the government, God promises for those who believe to establish his covenant for a thousand generations. I've never had more confidence that my great, great, great grandchildren will serve the Lord and be on fire for Jesus. Like, that's, believe that. Believe it. That's forward thinking. That's, that's multi-generational blessing. That many of us didn't experience that, but we need to understand the multi-generational blessing to help our children understand that at least 4,000 you know, generations. With every generation, it starts over with another thousand, so it never ends. We need them to understand that God has established a covenant with you and that he's faithful. This is something that we owe it to teach our children. Somebody say amen. amen. All, of, all of, and I don't go too far with this, um, but all of this um, just fake social justice, pro this, pro that, it's all deception from the devil. Yes, sir. Now, do we have problems? Of course. People are sinners. Always has been, always will be. So that's no denial that people are problems. Jeremiah 17, 6 or whatever, the human heart is deceitful, is desperately wicked. Who can know it? We know that already. But I'm telling you where the enemy is, is the deception of all these movements. And then it's one minute, it's the cultural feminist movement. Then it's the Me Too movement. Then it's Black Lives Matter. Now it's pro-Palestinian. And it, is, and it's every, it shifts. Every, every six months, there's going to be something new. And, and everybody's the kids on the college campus is mad, upset. Everybody's protesting. Everybody's fighting. And the enemy is using all of them to weaken our nation. He's a deceiver. He's a deceiver. And my encouragement to all of us, read your Bible. You must gain. We must have a biblical worldview and a biblical perspective about the end times that we're living in to not be sucked into somebody's movement. And by the way, now let's, man, I got to dial this back. Now listen, there, there's, some, there's, some, there's some heathen Wicked Jewish folks, just like there's some heathen, wicked folks from every other ethnic group in the world. So this is not saying that the Jewish people are all perfect and all that stuff. All throughout the Old Testament, God tells them, you stiff-necked, rebellious. God himself didn't like them. He tell Moses, step aside, I'm going to kill them all. <laughs> One moment, Moses wanted to get him, and God said, wait. The next moment, God wanted to get him. God says, Moses said, wait, Lord. We don't don't want everybody in the world to hear how God destroyed his own people. And then the people of the world are going to say, who is their God? So Moses had to talk God out of destroying his own people. (laughs) So I'm not I'm not saying like that's all perfect or anything like that. But I can tell you this. God made a covenant with a man by the name of Abraham. And that nation and that people group. It's not even really about them. It's about God making a covenant with a guy named Abraham. You read Genesis 15, splitting that car- those carcasses of animals and that torch and that smoking oven passing between those animal pieces with blood all on the ground. God was establishing a covenant with Abraham to say, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And I will give this land to you and your descendants. That's what this is about. That's what this is about. Now, the man, I can't I can't go this far. The the let's just say that many of the um, those who practice the Islamic religion, which was only started about the 600s A.D. So this is this is a much, much older issue, but it became hijacked to become a religious and a socio-political issue, and it got messy. It got messy. And we're all, the whole world is kind of an upheaval of this and that, you pro-Israel, pro-Palestinian, what have you. I'll just say this, and i move on. Nobody loves the Jewish or the Palestinian people more than Jesus. He, nobody loves them more than he, than he does. He, 
He died for the people of Gaza. Are you hearing me? Come on, let's do it. Come on, this is Christians now. We don't we don't demonize anybody. Come on, this is important. This is important because if we get into this pro stuff, then you end up picking a side. And that simply means that you're disqualified from God ever using you to minister to the people that he died for just as much as he died for you. So my attitude has to be different. My narrative has to be different. This Thanksgiving, when you sit with your family, change your message. (laughs) Because as Christians, we have to have a different perspective. Jesus shed his blood for every person who's in Hamas. He died for every one of them. Now, are their actions wicked? Absolutely right. Last thing, let me say it this way. If what I'm saying is not true, Saul of Tarsus would have never gotten saved. You know, Paul was a terrorist. Come on, folks. (laughs) Paul was a, Saul of Tarsus was a terrorist. And one day, He had a face-to-face encounter with Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of the living God. And became the greatest advocate and the greatest writer of the New Testament scriptures because that's what the power of Jesus Christ can do to anybody. Now, I know we got, I know there's all kinds of problems, man. I'm, 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 I'm beyond heartbroken at the violence and the devastation that you see with babies that were butchered in their bed. Man, that's, it's this the devil. But at the same time, I can pray wholeheartedly, Lord, let there be a revival in, God, in Gaza. Pour out your spirit, Lord. Let Jesus walk up and down the streets of Gaza. And who knows, man, a mosque go, go lay down their weapons. And everybody's crying out, what must I do to be saved? Jesus can do it. He can do it. He can do it. It's enough about that. I don't want to go down that far. Somebody say amen. <laughs> we, can't, we can't be ignorant during this time. I think, and I mean that in the true sense, many, many believers were, were ignorant about the purposes of God and the word of God and God's covenant. And what's happening in that region in the, in the world. We have to continue to preach the gospel. John 3.16 is for everybody. God so loved the world. And he gave his son. It's important for us to, us to remember that. So this is, this is why we have to have churches to preach the truth of God's word. For us to be equipped to be salt and light. Somebody say amen. You know? So we, that's, that's all not just having a message, but that's having a vision. It's not just having a message. It's having a vision, and we need that. We need that today. Um, Let's get going here. You guys are slowing me down. I'm not moving as fast as I want to. Let's start Habakkuk chapter 2. We know this. We're going to look at some things here. Habakkuk chapter 2. Let's start here talking about a vision. Verse 2 says, Then the Lord answered me and said, Who's doing the talking? Okay, so Jehovah is talking here. The Lord answered me and said, God's instruction is this, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. Write the vision. Notice God didn't say just preach the message. He said, write the vision and make it plain. That's why we're putting these booklets together. It says document it, write the vision so that he who may run, that he may run, may read it. He may run who reads it. Verse three, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. This is God doing the talking. He says the vision is going to come. It's going to happen. Verse four, behold, the proud, his soul is not upright in him. This phrase, but the just shall live by his what? So look at look at the connection there between the vision, running with the vision and living by faith. Same context there. He back in chapter two, verse two to verse four. God talks about documenting the vision 
And he ends talking about faith, that there was a connection between the, the vision and faith. It'll surely come, but faith is the, the mechanism that causes the vision to become a reality that even though it tarries, that it takes time, be patient, wait for it, that faith is working throughout time, but it's just a matter of time and the vision is going to become a reality. And God says, in the interim, the just shall live by what? Faith. Very important. We're going to come back to that. So just look at this instruction here. This is God's instruction to physically document the vision, to enable the people to run with the vision. He talks about the vision being timely. We talked about some of that, about, about that last week some. The vision will boldly speak and declare truth. It will unfold over time, and it requires patience, but the vision, the vision will surely come to pass, and the righteous people will run with it by faith. Now, notice this. He says, write the vision that he who reads it may run with it. If the vision is not documented and there is a, isn't a vision, there is no vision, the people don't have anything to run with. We need something to run with. And without, without a vision to run with, everybody's stuck. Every, everybody's perhaps going in the wrong direction, not going anywhere, going in reverse, because without a vision, there's nothing to run with. So vision gives us a target. We're running in the right direction. This is, this is the way for us to go. And God tells us that this is something that becomes a lifestyle of faith, that, that without a vision, whether it's in a church, if you don't have a vision for your home, guess what? You and your children will wander. Somebody say amen. amen. You know, a lot, a lot of kids end up wandering in life because you don't have a vision in your home. They get a vision from their friends. They get a vision from some girlfriend, some boyfriend, from some TV show. They get a vision from their, from, from their professor or some social group, their coach. And so kids go running off after a stronger vision than the vision you have for the family. Somebody say amen. Come on, honey. do a little bit of parenting. You need a very, very strong vision because people can't run where they don't have a vision. So it's a, it's a good time to sit your, sit your kids down, sit, your, sit down with your husband and wife. I mean, let's, let's, let's talk about the vision. Talk about the vision. And we're doing that as a, as a church, but we are, we are the church. Somebody say amen. I, th I think over the years, some, some folks, to some degree, maybe, you know, get disoriented with churches that have a message but have no vision. Because the mindset is, well, I, I heard the message. I hear a lot of messages. But if there's no vision and I don't know where to run and I don't know what we're running toward, I think people can get disoriented. I think, I think in any situation, folks can get disoriented. You know, I, I could never be on a sports team and be one of those players that practice hard every day and I never get in the game. Sometimes you're just watching. Some, some players, they just, they're on the sideline. They're on the bench. And I say, how do you get motivated to go to practice the next day? <laughs> When all you do is you just, you just sit on the bench, you sit on the sidelines. You know what? I want to be in the game. I want to contribute to my team winning. When there's a big play, when there's an obstacle, when we need to do something successful, I want to be a team player. I want to be in the game. I need to know the vision, coach, because vision helps us run. It helps us move in the right direction. Somebody say amen. It's important for us. We need, a, we need a vision. As a church, we're using our faith to prepare the way of the Lord and to prepare for the day of the Lord and to leave a strong legacy of faith for our children and our grandchildren and those that come behind us. We will not let them down. We will not let them down. You know, look, look around in the world. What other options do we have right now than the church of Jesus Christ? This is the time for us to have a vision for the house of God. And as I say, to build the ark of, of safety, you know, let's look here. Matthew chapter 24, verse 37. We'll come back 
quote this quite a bit here. Keep this in mind, Matthew 24, 20, 24, 37. Jesus says, but as the days of Noah were, so also will be will the coming of the Son of Man be. As the days of Noah were, Jesus says from his own mouth, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. So we're going we're gonna to look at that in terms of our vision and what motivates us to engage and move forward that Jesus himself is telling us about what will happen prior to his coming, just as it was in the days of Noah. And we're going to see what Noah did, what was his motive, what vision did Noah have to build something in light of the fact that the judgment of God was coming and something that we have to build in light of the fact that Jesus is coming. Somebody say amen. amen. Keep that verse in mind. We look at this timeline here. We saw this. It's in our, in our booklet that we handed out. We showed it last week. It's just a reminder, man, God has been at work in our midst, you know, since the mid-70s. God has been at work, and we're here in 2023, and we're going to keep on going to 2030, 2040, 2050 until Jesus comes. We're not going to stop, but we're going to keep on moving forward. God has already been at work. He's not going to start working. He's working now. We're here because he's already been working, and it's going to continue. Somebody say amen. We're in the middle of his working right now, and we're just stirring our hearts to be excited about the next thing, the next chapter that God has for us. So what, what is God looking for from his people? What is God looking for from his people? Let's start with John chapter 4, verse 23. John 4, 23 says, but the hour is coming and now is. Jesus is saying here, when the true worshipers, everybody say true worshipers. Notice here, the hour is coming and now is, both timely and time, when the true worshipers which means there are some false worshipers. <laughs> if he's talking about the true worshipers, then he's got to be talking in contrast to the false worshipers. Yes. Everybody say, I'm a true worshiper. I'm a true worshiper. Yeah, more and more we're going to see the separation of the true church and the false church. You're going to see that. So he talks about the true worshipers here. will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Big deal, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. In other words, God is looking for a certain kind of people in the world today. That's interesting. That's, that's one of the distinctions of Christianity. All the other religions, they're all looking for God. Christianity is God looking for you. Somebody say amen. amen. Every, every, every other religion, they're looking for God, looking for God, looking for God. God came looking for you. And I just tell you, he came and found me in a nightclub. Jesus found some of us on the street corner under a bridge in some, some adulterous relationship. And some, he, he came to find you and to rescue you out of your mess. He came looking for you came looking for you. So the Father is seeking people just to reciprocate, to worship him in spirit and truth. That's total surrender and total devotedness to God. Total devotedness. Everything I have, true, a true worshiper who worships God in spirit and truth is a person that says, I am totally devoted and I'm absolutely committed to God with everything I am and everything that I have. Me, my education, my car, my toothbrush, my money, my everything I am, I am a true worshiper. And Lord, I've come to give myself and everything I am to you. That's a true that's a true worshiper. Let's go to Second Chronicles 16, 19, 16, verse nine. I love this one. Second Chronicles 16, nine says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro again throughout the whole earth. God's looking around through the whole earth. Get this to show himself what? On behalf of those whose heart is what? Lord. To who? Yeah. Isn't that amazing? It says God is scanning the earth all the time to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. 
not the Democrats or the Republicans or to this group or that group. My heart is loyal to Jehovah alone. And when God finds people like that, he's looking to flex on their behalf and to show himself strong. Somebody say amen. Amen. He's looking for loyal hearted people to show supernatural expressions of his strength and his power. He's looking for people like that. (laughs) But here's a challenge for us. Let's go to Luke chapter 18, verse 7. Jesus speaks to this again. Luke 18, 7. He says, and shall not God, shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them, verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, here's the condition. When the Son of Man comes, will he really find what? Faith Faith on the earth. So God is looking for the true worshipers. His eyes are going throughout the earth looking to show himself strong and those whose hearts are loyal and upright toward him. But Jesus says, here's the issue concerning the coming of the Son of Man. When I come, he says, the question is, will I find faith? It's not a question about God's intent or what he desires to do, but Jesus is saying, will I find faith? Will will anybody qualify by living a life of faith for what it is that God desires to do? That same verse of scripture in Luke chapter 18, verse 8 from the New Living Translation, he says it this way, I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly, but when the Son of Man Everybody say returns. returns. We're talking about that. Preparing people for the day of the Lord as it was in the days of Moses, of, of Noah. We're in that time. But he says here, prior to his coming, when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? That prior to the return of Jesus, which I believe we're, we're of course, closer than we've ever been before, but I think we're, I think we're really close right now. And Jesus says, just before he comes, he's going to come looking for how many people have faith. Not not how many people who are of the faith, which is the Christian faith. How many people have faith and are living by faith prior to him coming, whose hearts are loyal toward the Lord? He says, that's the thing that he's going to be be looking for. All all the scriptures talk about the, the apostasy or the great falling away. A lot of folks are going to fall away from the faith in the last days. And it's the thing that Jesus is going to be looking for. You know, we have to be like those those wise virgins. Right. Matthew 25. Some virgins prepared their lamps and were awaiting the bridegroom and some were foolish that did not. We've got to be the wise virgins. We're prepared. We're anticipating living in faith, anticipating the coming of the son of God. Somebody say amen. The just shall live by his faith. Second Corinthians 5, 7, we saw this before. We walk by faith and not by sight. That same verse from the New Living Translation again. For we live by believing. We live by believing and not by seeing. Very important. Very important. Day in, day out, regardless of what you hear or what you see happening in the world, we live by believing, not by seeing. We live by believing, not by by seeing. It's it's an important time to be in a faith church right now that teaches faith and teaches us and equips us to believe God's word because those are the kind of people the Lord will be looking for prior to his come. Somebody say amen. Amen. We saw last time when faith becomes a mindset, it eventually becomes a skill set. When faith becomes a mindset, it eventually becomes a skill set. We talked about that last week. When James says, I'll I'll show you my faith to prove, I'll show you my works to prove that I believe. I'll show you my faith by my works. I'll show you my faith to prove that I believe. When faith becomes a mindset, it really becomes a skill set. And it's time to engage and to do and to build and to partner with the Lord concerning the advancing of his kingdom. Faith always and only moves forward. Faith always and only moves forward. Think, Think about this. Jesus, Jesus is communicated and described to us as the great shepherd. Isn't that true? He's the great shepherd. You know, shepherds are nomadic people. Shepherds are nomads. In other words, what that means is shepherds don't stay in the same place for too long. 
A shepherd will be in one place for a while. And when the grass is eaten up and it's time to move on, he moves the flock from that place to a new place. And the moment he settles in a new place, it's temporary. Because eventually, when the grass is eaten up in that area, the flock is going, he's going, the shepherd's going to move the flock on to somewhere else. Shepherds never stop moving. They never settle. And if Jesus is the great shepherd and we're the flock, he will not leave you in the same place too long. He's always looking to move you forward and to say, you know what, it's time to go on. Look, look at Psalm 23. I think we have that. Look, look at this, how this makes sense. And we've been quoting this since we were kids. It says he restores my soul. Look at this. He leads me in the path of righteousness. Watch this. For his name's sake. The Lord is my shepherd. Jesus is the great shepherd. He's, he's always moving the flock along. Leading us in paths of righteousness, get this, for his name's sake. You moving forward, us moving forward as a church, is not even about you. It's something that he's doing for his own name's sake. <laughs> Lord, I really wish I could move. He wants it, he wants it more than you could ever ask, think, or imagine, but when he comes, will he find faith? He, he, want, he wants to move you <laughs> to places you can't imagine. And he's not looking for us to figure out, try to chart it out and GPS it and get out the map, figure out. All, all when, he, when he returns, the, one, the only thing he's looking for is will he really find faith? And when the great shepherd finds faith and he finds people that are willing to move and willing to be led and willing to go with him, he'll, he'll move us on down the path of righteousness. Get this, for his name's sake. Remember how Paul says it's God who works in you both to will and to do for his own good pleasure? Amen. There's something pleasing to God that satisfies himself and is some kind of deep gratification within his own person when people live by faith and move with him God brings satisfaction to himself we're going to see it without faith it is impossible to do what please God whenever God sees faith is somehow he ministers to himself with a deep sense of satisfaction whenever he can find people that are willing to move with him he does it for his own Good pleasure. Folks, man, that, that excites me more than anything else to know that God gets gratitude. He gets pleasure when I'm willing to go with him. Step out on faith and just say yes, Lord. Say yes to the shepherd. Just say yes to the shepherd. He's, call, he's calling us. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> Don't deny him. He's calling us. I'll, I'll give you a step further. Go a step further. That, that passage we just read talks to us about us following the shepherd. He's leading us in the path of righteousness for his namesake. Get this. It ends by saying that goodness and goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. But get this. But get this. Goodness and mercy will only follow you as long as you are following the shepherd. Are you, come on, you hear me? Goodness, good, the reason goodness and mercy is following you is, is because the shepherd is good and merciful. You're following the good one and the merciful one. So as long as you're following him, goodness, goodness and mercy is going to follow you because you're following him. Come on, it just, it just keep on moving forward with the Lord. That whenever, whenever he moves, we're not going to stay behind. We're going to stay right there with the shepherd as he's moving his body. Somebody say amen. 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 Glory to God. There's, um, maybe we'll come back to this. I, I love, uh, there's a story, Second, Second Kings, maybe chapter 7. I talk about moving forward. It talks about um, those lepers. You guys remember that? The story of those lepers when, they, when the Syrians had laid siege, and there were these four lepers sitting at the gates. 
And uh, the lepers asked this question. They said, why sit we here until we die? <laughs> the, lepers, the lepers are sitting around one day, and they said, why sit we here until we die? And they said, they said this way. They said, if, if, we, if we just keep sitting here, we're going to die. There was a famine in the land. If we, if we sit here, we know we're going to die. They said, if we, if we go over here, there's a famine in the land, we might die. And if we go further, we might run into the Syrian army. They might kill us and we might die, but they might spare our lives. And so the, the, Syri- the, the leper said, well, let's, let's just not stay here. Let's at least get up and go over to where the Syrian army is because they might sustain us. They had a mindset and faith to move forward. And you know what happened? The Bible says when they got to where the Syrian army was, says that just before they got there, God had scared and run off all the army. And the army was so scared, they left all the treasure and all the riches and the silver and gold. And here come these lepers (laughs) hobbling up. And they, they walked into wealth and abundance that God has supernaturally provided for them just because they decided by faith to not stay where they were, we need to go. We need to go. So God frightened off all the army, the army that all disappeared and run off and said there was nothing but silver and gold and all the food that they wanted to eat simply because they had faith to move forward. Somebody say amen. amen. We'll, we'll come back to that. Let's, let's go here. Hebrews 10, 37. We saw the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 10, 37. We saw this last week. It says, for yet a little while, look at this theme again, and he who is coming will come. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? That the vision, living by faith, is connected to writing the vision, all in relationship to the fact that the Son of Man is coming. All relationship in relationship to the fact that he is coming says for yet a little while and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Verse 38. Here it is again. Now the just shall live by what? We just read that in Habakkuk chapter two, verse four. The just shall live by faith. And here's the contrast. But if anyone draws back, we said before, that means to be coward or to be timid. My soul, God says, has no pleasure in him. There it is again. We see God pleased whenever we have faith, whenever we're willing to move forward with God. It brings brings God pleasure. But he gives us the contrast here that when we're not willing to move with God or we go backward, God has no pleasure in those who draw back. Verse 39, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition or to destruction, but of those who believe to Those who believe to the saving of the soul, believing to or believing toward, believing forward. Faith is always moving. Believing is always moving with the great shepherd to move forward. Somebody say amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Again, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. As I said before, that term in the Greek literally means he's the one who hands out and signs the paycheck. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Verse 7 tells us this. When when faith becomes a mindset, faith now becomes a skill set. Verse 7, by faith Noah. Remember Matthew 24, Jesus says, as it was in the days of who? so will also be the coming of the Son of Man. So let's look at what, ha- look at what happened in the days of Noah. By faith, in verse 7, Noah being divinely warned of things not seen. Everybody say he moved. He moved with godly fear. I mean, there was an urgency. There was, there was something that God was doing that, Mo- that Noah could sense. And because, number one, he had been divinely warned, he moved with godly fear He prepared. He prepared an ark for the saving of his household. 
by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. That's what happened in the days of Noah. Noah was a man of faith. He found grace in the eyes of God. When nobody else was living for God, Noah was one guy, sold out to God, found grace in the eyes of God. And so God established a covenant with Noah and began to communicate to Noah some things that nobody else understood was about to take place. Nobody else understood that judgment was coming. And because Noah was a man of faith and found grace in the eyes of God, God says, let me talk to you. And tell you what's about to happen. So he was divinely warned by God himself about some things that were not seen. And because of that divine warning, based upon a conversation that only he had with God, that nobody else had, he started to move with godly fear and he started building. He started building. Can't you see the folks around Noah? Silly old man. Now, the Bible says he was a preacher of righteousness. So Noah was actually trying to tell other people, like, you better get right with God. (laughs) It's going to rain. I don't think scripturally there's no indication that it ever rained before. They were probably like, rain, what's that? (laughs) He He was trying to tell folks he was a preacher of righteousness. You need to get right with God. God's judgment is coming. You need to get right with God. No, we're not listening to him. But he had a conversation with Jehovah who gave him a warning. So he moved with godly fear. He started preparing an ark for the saving of his household. That's why we call the church an ark of safety. Folks, it's time. It's time to get to work, Jim. Yes, sir. (laughs) It's time. It's time to get, get to work. It's time to build the ark of safety. Why? Because Jesus said, it happened with Noah, it's going to happen again. Prior to my coming, it's going to happen again. But when I come, will I find faith? Will I find anybody who believes, anybody who's willing to act upon what they believe to move and to go with God? Somebody say amen. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. A couple more here. Look at this. So we talked about Faith, what is God looking for? When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? He's going to be looking for faith. People whose hearts are loyal and upright toward him. Uh, looking for people who, who believe God. So what kind of faith is he looking for? Well, the Bible talks to us about something that we call childlike faith. So not just faith, but there's a kind of faith that the Lord is looking for. Look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 2. We'll look at a few more of these. Matthew 18, 2 says this. Then Jesus called a little child to him, set that child in the midst of all the adults. And as they say in the South, they say, let me let me learn y'all something. (laughs) Put put that little child. Get this right in the middle of all the adults. This is important. Verse three and said, assuredly, I say to you, adults, unless you are converted And become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Interesting story here. Jesus is with the adults, go finds a little child, brings the child right in the midst and starts to explain. If you don't become like this child concerning your faith, you will by no means move forward to enter the kingdom. Unless you learn to believe like this child. Verse four Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus talks to us about that childlike kind of faith and and humbling ourselves. You know, a part of humbling ourselves is, you know, Lord, I, I can't do anything without you. Lord, that kind of humility is, Lord, I'm I'm nothing without you. I have nothing. You're the true vine. Apart from you, I, I can do nothing. Jesus says that I'm the true vine and you're the branches separated from you, Jesus. I can't do anything. That's that kind of humility that we see here. The interesting thing about childlike faith is watch this. Children are totally dependent. 
that's 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 what characterizes children. You got a you got a three year old. They're incapable of sustaining or taking care of themselves. A three year old child is one hundred percent dependent upon their parents. Can't feed themselves. Can't change themselves. Can't take care of themselves. Can't get them in the bed. Get them out of the bed hardly. 100% 100% dependent upon the Father. And Jesus says, until you get that kind of faith that you are totally dependent upon the Father, you can't enter the kingdom. Totally dependent. Like a child. And this is the story that Jesus was teaching the adults. Which adulthood means we are independent. Jesus said, you got to get rid of your independence from God and go back to total Dependence on God if you want to move forward into the kingdom. <laughs> Somebody with me this morning? <laughs> Simple obedience. Look, I'll give you a few more here. John chapter 6, verse 9. Watch this one. Glory to God. John 6, verse 9. Remember this childlike faith that we're talking about. It says in John 6, 9, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves, right? You know the story. All these people are hungry. You got these... 15,000 people or so needed to be fed. And uh, they said, there's a, there's a child here. Remember that childlike faith thing. There's a child here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many people? So keep in mind this childlike faith. This, this kid, apparently, when Jesus needed his lunch, the kid put up no resistance for his seed. When Jesus needed his lunch, this kid, childlike faith, put up no resistance in surrendering to Jesus his fish and his loaves. He put up no resistance. I, I think in the mind of a child, now the adults, when Jesus talked to them and said, Lord, uh, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for us to, to buy enough bread for all these people. And the adults were trying to figure out how far away is the bakery? Do we have enough time to bake the bread? Who's going to pick the bread up? That much bread is not in the budget. Some folks are probably, I only eat gluten-free bread. It's like, <laughs> come on, are you hearing me? All the adults, we, we get, we talking, this, we got all kinds of reasons for why we can't feed 15,000. Like we, it just won't work out, Lord. And I think the moment this little kid recognized Jesus needs my lunch, ooh, 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 ooh. And the kid surrendered his lunch. To Jesus. <laughs> when this little boy shared his lunch, listen, he modeled and demonstrated a profound truth concerning faith that when we offer ourselves and what we have to God, God's power can work through us. This boy with two small fish and five loaves of bread never wondered if his lunch could or could not help Jesus. He simply offered it willingly. If the kid held on to his lunch, maybe he would have been the only person to eat that day. But it was his generosity and his faith that supplied what was needed for 15,000 people to eat that day because of his childlike faith and his willingness to simply give Jesus his bread and his lunch. That's childlike faith. Can you imagine how that little kid felt watching all those people eat because of my lunch? (laughs) This kid, this childlike faith reminds us to live by faith and to know that we're only stewards of what God gives us and never our owners. Get this. Maybe the kid knew it wasn't his lunch. It was Jesus' lunch all along. He was just giving back to Jesus what he already knew belonged to him. Childlike faith. Somebody say amen. I was so excited last Sunday when we launched our 
forward campaign. We did it in youth, youth group and children's ministry. And one of the, one of the children's ministry director came to us after church and says, the kids were so excited about the forward campaign and said the kids were telling the, the, the children's ministry directors, we are the church. <laughs> We're going to bring our money because we are the church. And one, one, of, one of the couples in our church sent us a message and said when they got home last Sunday that their, their kid says, listen, we're going to pave the parking lot and we're going to get our Skokie campus a building. <laughs> said the kids were fired up. We're going, we're going, the kids were saying, we're going, to, we're going to take care of this. They're, they're the kind of kids who would have given Jesus their lunch. I want that kind of childlike faith to give Jesus my fish and my loaves so that he can do something exponentially greater through our seed and what we bring to him than we could ever do that's sufficient for ourselves only. Somebody say amen. Amen. I'll give you one more here. Forward means to send on to a further destination. It means to help advance. God has something in the future for us. Exodus 14, 15, we'll come back to this passage because it's foundational to our forward series. Exodus 14, 15, and the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Now, that's, that's ironic because they were standing in front of the, the Red Sea. There was no way in the natural to go forward. And God is telling the people, Go forward. Well, God, some people don't know how to swim. Some people are afraid to swim. We don't have enough boats. We don't have enough life preservers. Why are you telling us to go forward when we can't go forward? Can't you see that there's, a, there's an ocean here that we can't cross and all these people can't swim? God says, tell the people to go forward. And the word tells us with the blast of his nostril, folks, as Moses lifted up the rod of God, Jesus himself being the rod and the stem of Jesse, representative of the word of God, as he lifted up the rod of God with the blast of God's nostril, he split the ocean wide for the people to pass over on dry ground. So from the time that God told the people to go forward, he already had the plan for how they were going to go and how they were going to come out on the other side. Are you hearing me this morning? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not, he's not changed. Our God is not changed. Somebody say amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. Look at Matthew 14, 22. Watch this one. It's too good for me to take home. Matthew 14, 22 says immediately... Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him where? It's time to go to the other side. Everybody say other side. side. So he told him, go before him to the other side. And when he sent the, while he sent the multitudes away, when he had sent the multitudes away, Jesus went up on the mountain by himself to do what? Everybody say pray. Pray. He tells them to go to the other side. Jesus went up to the mountain to pray. Very important. Now, when the evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea with the disciples, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary to them. In other words, they got stuck in the middle of the sea trying to get to the other side. Take a look at Mark 6, 48, and it explains it this way. Mark says this, then he saw them straining at rowing because the wind was against them. He told them to go to the other side. They're huffing and puffing and paddling and rowing. They get to the middle of the sea, arms tired. The wind is blowing against them. We're not going to make it. But Jesus didn't say go to the middle of the sea and drown. He told him to go to where? The other side. (laughs) He said go to the other side. So they're stuck in the middle. They're rowing and they're straining. 
their human effort was expended. There's nothing else they could do. Mark chapter 14, verse 25. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. <laughs> He's walking on the sea. Verse 26, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, be of good cheer. It is I. Don't be afraid. Walking on the sea. John chapter 6, verse 21. Watch this. Then they willingly received him into the boat. Watch this. And everybody say immediately. immediately. They willingly received him into the boat. And immediately the boat was over to the other side. Are you, are you getting this? Go to the other side. Jesus went off to pray. While they were rowing, Jesus was praying. They got stuck. <laughs> Can't go any further. This happens in life. This happens with our family. This happens with your career. It happens in all, we get stuck. Sometimes you just get stuck and you're just wrong and you're tired. Like, Lord, I can't row anymore. I'm tired. <laughs> and then Jesus comes by walking on the sea. And when they willingly received him in the boat, after he had been praying, it says immediately and supernaturally, somehow, some way, they didn't have to row anymore. Somehow the Spirit of God, by the power of God, took that boat and transported that boat to their destination. It was not by might, not by power, not by rowing, but it was by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Somebody say amen this morning. I, I, I told Pastor Sharon this. I'm going to come back to this. When we were talking about how, how David engaged Goliath and when he wanted to defeat his enemies, the Lord spoke to me the other morning and, and, and opened this verse of scripture to me that, that David did not defeat his enemies, his enemy, Goliath. He did not defeat his enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Goliath. He did not defeat his enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Goliath. He defeated his enemy in heart-to-heart -heart covenant with God. Are you hearing me? He did not defeat the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat with this giant. He defeated his enemy in heart-to-heart -heart covenant with God. The, the, the devil always wants to lure you into a fight. He always wants to lure you into hand-to-hand -hand combat. You can't win that fight in the natural. If you try to fight him with hand-to-hand -hand combat in the natural, you will be destroyed. But when you have heart-to-heart -heart covenant with God, the Lord will fight for you. The Lord will fight for us. Somebody say amen. You get anything out of the word this morning? Man, let me just shut it down because I'll be here all day. So what we'll do before we go, you received a few things, I think, when you came in. Did everybody get a couple of these? I'll just explain what, what's going to happen before we leave. And so I think you got, you got two of these today, if I'm not mistaken. All right. So this, you know, I've been sharing today, moving forward by faith. And we just saw that, that while the disciples were, row, were rowing, Jesus went off to pray and he sought, he sought the Lord. And we've been talking about the power of faith that, that for us to move forward, we're not just going to set out to row in our little boat to try our best to get to the other side. The word says when they, when they willingly invited Jesus 
into the boat. Immediately he took them there. So we're not, we're not starting our forward campaign in our own effort and strength. This is a card that says 21 day spiritual journey. And it's a time for us to, to get in faith and to stir our hearts and to get our hearts in alignment to invite Jesus into our campaign. To have that childlike faith to say, Lord, we're dependent upon you. We're believing you for what you have for us as a church. And so this is simply a commitment card that I would ask if you have a pen and before you go to go ahead and fill this out right now. It's just it's just a commitment card for the next 21 days. We're going to be praying together and fasting together as a church. And it's, it's listed here that there's kind of an in, in intermediate track that if you want to just fast a little bit, but then if you want to fast a little bit more, there's an advanced track. All of this is going to be communicated. You're going to leave with a booklet today that our team has put together a great booklet before the next few weeks us engage, for us to engage, establish, and be equipped, and be empowered. That there's a great guide here that, that our team has put together. I'm thankful for Elder Mark and Elder Bobby to help us to lay some of these things out, but this is a guide for you to take home and a spiritual commitment card for you to just sign before you leave. And our, our guest services team is going to take this from you. It's just a commitment for us to say we're inviting Jesus in the boat. We just want Jesus to be involved. We, we need the Lord's hand upon us for us and our family. So you'll leave this commitment card before you leave today. And this second card is something that you'll take with you uh, home and keep it. And as we're on our spiritual journey, we're going to be praying over this card for the next three weeks or so until November 19th. This is just an intent to God, intent to give. And so over the next few weeks, we're saying, Lord, we're praying. Show us, show me what you would do. Let's pray as a husband and wife, Lord. Show us what we should do as a family concerning our giving for our church's giving campaign, Lord. I want to bring my fish. I want to bring my loaves. I want to give you my lunch. And so we're simply praying, Lord, show us what to do for the next three weeks. And then on November 19th, we'll bring these cards back as our commitment to the Lord to invest in what it is, what it is that he has for us as a church. And um, you can pick these up again before you go. And as you leave, we have a very nice booklet that just talks about our spiritual journey and us inviting Jesus into our campaign. If you did not get one of these, we have more to have the vision here. We've written a vision so that we can read it and we can run. I've never in my in the history of my life in church, I've never been more excited than I am right now about the great thing that God has for us. The zeal of the Lord has consumed us in Jesus name. Can you say amen? amen. Let's give the Lord. A hand. You know, the Bible tells us that God's word is like a hammer that breaks or dashes the rocks into pieces, friends. And Whatever rocks, whatever things in your life seem to be uh, calcified, fossilized and unchangeable situations that you think would never change because they're too hard, uh, cases that are too hard. The Bible asks the question, is there anything too hard for the Lord? I'm telling you that the truth of God's word can break down any impossible situation in your life. Always remember that faith comes by hearing and not because you heard, but by hearing the word of God. So listen to this teaching over and over again. I know that each time you do, you're going to hear something different. Your life is going to be changed, friends. Go ahead and uh, take a look at all of the videos on our YouTube channel. Go ahead and subscribe. Make sure you click the notification bell and like today's service as well. It just keeps you in a position so that you can stay up to date with all the great resources we have to offer uh, here at Insight Church, friends. Before we go, I do want to remind you to become a partner and to give, to invest, to be involved in the area of giving, to help us build and expand the mission and the vision of Insight Church through any of the means you see on your screen there. And before we go, I would like to speak God's blessing over you and your family by simply saying to you, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, friends, and give you his peace. Always remember, Jesus loves you. Pastor Sharon and I love you. Be well, be encouraged. I look forward to seeing you next time.
sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us, and all who will believe, will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions. Your name. Yeah.